takes a step everything from up above here on earth sing of his love everyone who's on a mountain everyone in the driest place praise him praise him praise him in the morning when the feeling's gone praise him in the evening when you're on First speaker is Abraham Thomas. Abraham serves as the president of SBS. That's an organization that is dedicated and committed to sharing the good news with young children in India. Uh, he and his wife, Betsy, were commended to the Lord's work. Uh, they left secular employment in the area of Bahrain in 1996, and they moved to Kerala, India. Abraham's primary ministry, of course, is teaching and training in the assemblies over India. We're glad to have him here with us today. We're very privileged to have all these participants with us uh, in this Focus on India seminar, and we're delighted to turn the platform over to Brother Thomas at this point. 
As he comes forward, by the way, I want to mention he has a table in the back, and you can avail yourself of some of those materials, including uh, a uh, Indian currency uh, attached to a prayer card to remember the work that he does for the Lord in India. Brother Thomas, good to have you here. I bring greetings from India, from the 1.21 billion people of India, also from 480 million children with whom I am dealing every day. So we have to go to India, and then we'll have a quick review and an overview of what is happening in India. It's only 8,500 miles from here, and fasten your seat belts, and it will take 18 hours and nine minutes to reach India. Are you ready? OK, let's make a move. <laughs> Focus on India. At the end of the day, I want to focus on yourself so that we can do much more than what we are doing for the Lord today. When we talk about the history of India, this is the second most populous country in the world. We might overtake China by 2030. By the time our population will be 1.5 billion people. So it's a great nation. And it's already mentioned that Hinduism, Buddhism, and some other religions were born in India. And then, of course, people are telling that Christianity is a foreign religion there. When considering the Christianity, the believers number, we cannot count. But altogether, according to the census, they say that we have 3% of the population, they belong to Christian community. But nowadays, from different sources, we found that we have more than 3% of Christians in India. When you look at this one dot there, this one white dot denotes 5,000 Christians where they are living. So if you go down here, this is my place from where I'm coming, Kerala. He was mentioning Kerala. <laughs> I'm from Kerala. So you can see a bright light all throughout Kerala. We have the largest Christian community living in Kerala. And then, of course, in Tamil Nadu, in Andhra Pradesh, and coastal area up to Mumbai. And then some areas of uh, Orissa and Bihar, Jharkhand. And then we can see a bright light in the northeastern states of India. These northeastern states are known as the seven sisters of northeast. So Assam to Tribura, we have seven states bordering to China. It's a volatile area for every Indian. So the land to be yet to be possessed, and the harvest is really, truly plentiful there. So that's what we have to go and look. When we talk about India, India is one of the largest uh, uh, democratic nations in the world. Our president is uh, Pranak Kumar Mukherjee, and uh, the political head is the Prime Minister, Dr. Manmohan Singh. He's one of the most educated uh, political leaders in the world. And whenever, when this uh, recession took place across the world, even India stood firm because of his uh, uh, economic policies, and we have a lot of things to th see in India. See, this is, uh, we can say, our White House, or the Rashtrapati Bhavan, and see, of course, uh, this is Taj Mahal, you know, one man, because of his wife, the love for her, he made this Taj Mahal. I don't know how many of you are going to make like this. <laughs> <laughs> and then you can see some of the beautiful places. So let us go quickly to Kerala. Ah, this is the boat race. And you know, in river, this is one of the famous rivers in Kerala, Pamba River. And I had the privilege of baptizing many people in this river. And during uh, some of the festivals, they have this kind of uh, beautiful boat race there. So people are calling Kerala as God's own country. So whenever you get a chance, come and visit Kerala, and you will have a beautiful uh, time there. We already mentioned that St. Thomas, the disciple of Lord Jesus Christ, the doubting Thomas, came to India in AD 50. It is said that he brought the Gospel of Matthew, and many people embraced the Christianity during his time in India. Later he was killed and uh, he was buried in Tamil Nadu. And in uh, recognition of his service to India, 
the government of india produced a postal stamp and uh, with his name some of the denominational churches are known in kerala like marthoma church and orthodox churches and all when he came there was the presence of people from syria and other places and because of that all those people were known as syrian christians but his ministry was excellent and then when i am talking about kerala further the second wave of great revival started in kerala by the arrival of tamil david in 1894 we heard that and grows came to india at the same time in 1800s there was a revival taken place across the world i think basically in europe and this man came to india at the same time the native believers were touched by the holy spirit and they went back to the bible and they were able to read the word of god and they were able to start the new testament pattern churches and uh, another great missionary who established assemblies in the northern part of kerala was brother hanley bird a foreign missionary and then the first brethren gathering it was not a big gathering only four people were there they came in kumbanad on march 19 1899 p maman p p john p c john p c chako and koshi mathunni i'll talk about him a bit these first four, four people they came out from the denominational churches and then they uh, conducted the lord's supper on sunday morning and koshi mathuni was a visitor there koshi mathuni he is my great grandfather he lived 103 years i had the privilege of meeting him and also this kumbanad is famous because the brethren movement took roots in kerala and from the very place we have a lot of indian believers here and here one uh, jkb is sitting with the videography his great grandfather was one among them and he and his parents are still living in kumbanad where the worship meeting started and this is the assembly hall in kumbanad which was established in 1899 and after that many missionaries like eh noel and others came to india noel he came from england he was a very rich man he sold all his properties and took the money and came to kerala and he lived among the poor and we have seen lot of poor people but that is not the situation now wherever the gospel has penetrated the people's life has been totally changed you will see people like me standing here <laughs> so the gospel can change the people even today so noel he established many schools there i was one of the student of his school it is still there there are 30 or more schools started by him then he had medical uh institutions and other things uh, he was he died in kumbanad in the same place where he labored and we can see the tombstone there recently i went there in fact i saluted him for his commitment for the lord he died uh, uh, in 1943 even i was not born at the time when he died his wife sent a telegram to his people in uk mr noel has been promoted to glory praise the lord such men when they buried in the land of india that was the beginning of the missions and missionary work see in the same place every year we have a convention and uh, during 2012 december i had the privilege of attending the convention it was the 110th convention and look at the arrangement this is a temporary arrangements uh, for a week long program believers from different parts of kerala Uh, almost 110 assemblies nearby gather on sunday morning for worship look at the people amazing you know when it was started with four people now you can see in the same place 4000 to 5000 people are gathering for a worship meeting on sunday and these are the men eh noel v nagel jm davis I, i i don't have time to go through all the names but they are the people really came to the indian land and penetrated with the gospel of jesus christ when talking about missions in north india my brother shaluti nayanan will bring more light into it but i want to tell little bit about it 
In 1800, some of the foreign missionaries, they came to North India in Bihar. Bihar is uh, very close to Calcutta, and uh, Bihar was known as the graveyard of missionaries. In fact, today, even today, we have persecution and problem in the state of Bihar. Now, each time when I go to Bihar, there is a cemetery, this Jamdara. This is one of the largest mission compound we have in India. These missionaries, in 19, 1865, they started the first assembly hall. It is still there, 1865, 150 years ago. And they buried their infants and their kids and themselves in Jamdara. The land was known for graveyard of missions. When they buried their kids and themselves, that was the beginning of the missions in North India. Now we have a beautiful Bible college there, uh, North India Bible, Inst uh, I mean the Bengal Training Institute. And we have a lot of people every year passing out from the institute. These are some of them. And when we talk about the assemblies in uh, all over India, as mentioned, it was said that 2,500, 2,500 assemblies are there, plus 2,500 plus evangelists are there. This is not maybe uh, accurate because we cannot get uh, adequate information about them. But I have a book, a prayer handbook. Uh, I'll be giving to the CMML. Uh, in this, we have almost 2,000 plus evangelists serving in different parts of country uh, in India. And uh, with the help of these men, we were able to start many assemblies in North India. So already we have seen from the video how these people are gathering for the worship meeting in different parts of the country. And this is, if I go to different states of North India, when, I, when you see my picture, don't misunderstand that I'm the only one doing something in India. There are hundreds of men and women there. These pictures were, are from my uh, album. Every year I go to North India several times. Those pictures were taken. And when uh, CMML asked me to present this program, uh, from that album only I took these pictures. Don't misunderstand me. This is not a promotional program for me. <laughs> and there are many hundreds of men and women really laboring for the Lord in North Indian states. This is Rajasthan. Fifty years ago, four men from Chennai, they were studying in one of the Bible schools in the south. They wanted to go to North India for the gospel. They said, we don't have money. We will walk and go. They said, we will go. And by the time somebody sent some money, and with the help of that money, they bought in a train and reached in Rajasthan. And that was the beginning of the Brethren movement in Rajasthan. In 2011, we celebrated the golden jubilee of the Brethren movement there, and it was a blessed occasion, and, uh, and many assemblies are growing in that part of the country. And also we have a Bible school, North India Bible Institute in Alwar, Rajasthan. It was started 25 years ago. While I am speaking here now, they are celebrating their silver jubilee and I bring greetings from T.J. Joseph and his colleagues in Rajasthan, Alwar. These cycles are, I mean, uh, just a minute. These cycles are not for sale. When these uh, men are joining the Bible school the next day, Brother T.J. Joseph will give them a cycle. You know, immediately after the lunch, they have to go to the different villages and spread the gospel. Because of that, we can see a lot of assemblies in and around that area. So this is the assembly there. And when we, uh, last few, few days ago, I was in uh, Jharkhand. Jharkhand is very close to Bihar. This was a part of Bihar now, a part of Bihar before. Now, last, on 15th February, we have dedicated an assembly hall. Look at the assembly hall now. So now people are interested in serving the Lord in different parts of our country. This is actually by the donations of some believers from Australia. One businessman, John Melville, and his family came to this area and they have seen the real work there. And they donated some amount to bring up an assembly hall like this. See, beautiful assembly hall and the program were conducted on 15th of uh, February this year. Ah, you can see some of your people here. <laughs> oh, powerful, okay. And, you know, there were almost 600 evangelists, English-speaking evangelists from India gathered for the GFTI, Gospel 
Trust of India program uh, during uh, la uh, last year, and uh, some of them you are very familiar. So, so this is the picture of the people gathered there. Look at them, and uh, myself, Shalu, and all there. So this is the 18th All India Workers Conference, the Gospel Fellowship Trust of India. They are supporting, uh, of course, so around 1,000 people. But many are not yet supported by any assembly funds. Because these men are recently converted into Christianity to our assembly faith. And in turn, when they got the call for the Lord Jesus Christ, they set apart their life for the full-time ministry. And we have to support such young men and women in the North Indian state. A few weeks ago, I was in Bengal and, uh, of course, in, Rajast in uh, uh, Chakradarpur in uh, Charkhan, we met uh, almost 200 evangelists. Many of them are below the age of 30. And I asked their background. Most of them came to the faith during the last 10 years. And uh, most of them came for full-time ministry during the last five years. So great potential, great work is going on in India. Yesterday, as Bob mentioned, many a time our people are telling, uh, brother and movement, uh, brother and assemblies are dying. No, open your eyes and see, go to North India and go to other African countries and you will see a lot of assemblies are coming up these days. Praise the Lord for that. And, uh, oh, who is this? <laughs> you know, he's a man, you know, he don't have any job in USA. <laughs> he and his wife come for a picnic in India. <laughs> And uh, look at this beautiful lady with the sari. <laughs> and she visited my home uh, along with uh, Steve. And we had a wonderful time there. And in turn, last year, I visited North Dakota. How many of you have been to their house? <laughs> See, no hands. OK, a couple of hands only. <laughs> See, we have to reciprocate, you know? So thank you, Steve. <laughs> OK. And when we talk about the uh, statistics of some of the missions, among the Assembly commended workers, 62% of the missionaries target 8% of the population that they are the tribal people. You know, you have seen some of the pictures of the tribal people. They don't have anything. They don't have schools. They don't have hospitals. They don't have home to live. They don't have an assembly hall. But in such areas, our people are going and working there. And 2% of the missionaries target the Muslims. 28% of them Target the low caste uh, Hindus. Caste system is still prevail in India, and uh, these men are working there. Eight percent of the missionaries target the sixty percent of Indian population that is the higher caste or the Hindus. So there we have to expand our work now. I live in Kochi. We have one point five billion mil million people living in Kochi now, because our city is growing from the IT field and engineering field and medical field, many youngsters are migrating to my city. When they are coming out from their homes, they don't have any barriers of religion or faith. So they are free people. So we have to train our people to meet the requirements of these young men and women. They are educated group. They are the people, very potential area. So we are planning and praying that Lord may open some ways to reach this uh, educated community in the cities. And uh, talking about the government of India, government of India is determined to provide better education to the younger generation now. So recently, they passed a bill in the parliament that uh, education is the birthright of every Indian. And uh, during the last week, our finance minister, P. Chidambaram, he declared a huge amount in the budget for the education of the poor people. So we will see a different India within the ne next uh, 10 years. And also another significant law uh, uh, passed in, uh, that was uh, passed in 2009, for historic law, education is the birthright of children. See, look at this. This was announced on November 12th of 12, uh, 2012. National Education Day, President of India, Pranab Mukherjee, introduced a new version of the low-cost tablet computer with a quicker processor and an improved battery. 
on sale to students at the subsidized price of dollars 20 you know they are determined to provide computers to every village students by 2025 so you will see a different india after 10 years and we have to understand that and our assemblies and our people to open their eyes and understanding how we can reach this educated group in 2020. So there we have to put our resources. Our ordinary system of evangelism may not work there. So these men and these boys and girls will be exposed to the latest technology. And through that, maybe it is easy for us to communicate the gospel. You know, that's the cheapest way we can penetrate into every Indian home. For an evangelist or a Bible to enter into an Indian home is difficult. But through these kind of gadgets, we can enter into every situation and we have to train our people for that. I know that I'm going to be misfit, misfit by 2020. But who are the people for 2020? Our children, those who are in 9th grade, 10th grade and 12th grade. Identify them, provide them training, give them missionary challenge. Yesterday we were talking about that. Our assemblies, we are very particular about doctrine and theology and all these things. Very good. We are known for that. But what about the missionary challenge for our young generation? You know, I got this challenge from my grandfather and from my assembly. I grew up in a Christian family. And when the assembly movement started in Kerala, in the following year, the assembly started in my hometown. And there was no assembly hall. 35 years. The assembly meeting gathered in my grandfather's place. My cousins are here, my, some of my sisters, Chinna Mama, Kunyola Mama, Mary Kutti, Thambi, Yoni Chan and family. All these people, yesterday I was talking to them. They said, they still remember the days when we gathered in the home for the assembly gathering. From there, our grandfather impacted this message of gospel into our hearts. And he challenged us. I was working with him. I really enjoyed working with him. That's why I got the mission mind. And that's why in the year 1996, I was able to resign from my secular job and enter into the full-time ministry. So we have to see that in a very particular way and to move forward. And the younger uh, uh, sociological changes, the younger people from all religious backgrounds have already embraced the philosophy that God and religion are not needed for leading a happy life. Denominational churches, they are dying. People are going to charismatic movements, new generation churches with music and all these things, no gospel, no outreach. They enjoy within the four walls of the churches and they enjoy Christianity there. So we have to understand the fact and then to make necessary arrangements to tackle the issue and to bring these people into doctrine and also into mission, cha mission challenges. Young people are uh, uh, attracted to novel revival groups. That is what is happening. And uh, when we talk about the assembly institutional work, we have six major Bible schools and 12 minor institutions. And uh, we have Sunday school magazines, conventions, and all these things. When I'm talking about the assembly activities in India, really, we are blessed with a lot of literature. Our men, our faithful men, they were to the point of Bible and they were able to expose the word of God in a diligent way to each one of us. And uh, we have produced the Sunday school curriculum. We have 12 books now, kindergarten to 11th grade now. In turn, it is our desire to translate this Sunday school curriculum into major Indian languages. It's not an easy job. Translation is one of the big problems we are facing in India. But while I'm speaking here, now in Kochi, in one of the printing presses, seven books in Canada, standard one to seven, are on the machine now, on the offset machine. When I'm going back, we are going to release it in Bangalore for the Canada speaking people. And I appreciate and salute Brother Jacob Martin here. Where are you? Anyway. So he got a burden to translate these books into many of the Indian languages. Every time he phones me, he did not go to India for 20 years. The reason, he spared that money to translate or print literature for India. I praise God for it. Amen. And we need such people. I know many of our Indian people here, they are supporting the ministry in India. We have a larger number of 
Indian assemblies in New York and like MS Matthew Engel is heading the Indian Brethren Assembly and many of my colleagues and friends from different assemblies are here. I appreciate that. And now it is our priority to translate and print these books. So in North India, we can give some stuff to the people when they are coming for the assembly activities. So, and also we have developed a workbook for every student up to the eighth grade. So when they are studying in the Sunday school, they will have a book for the students and they can go through the books. And uh, for the uh, SBS ministry, I'll come to that quickly. And uh, we have the, you have seen the Indian children in different uh, ways, you know. Recently, I, I was in Tamil Nadu for a school, a beautiful school. 1,200 students, Christian students are studying there. Means it's a Christian school, 1,200 students are coming. Every day they have an assembly and we preach gospel there. Some of our men are going there every week. And this man, I have to salute him. He's the first brother and man went out of Kerala with the gospel of Jesus Christ. He was a school teacher in Noel School. And when he got the challenge, he quit his job and went to Tamil Nadu. And because of his activity among the children, he started the ministry known as the SBS or the Child Evangelism Ministry in India. And I'm a part of that. I was born and brought up in the SBS ministry. And then we have a lot of activities now. We have the Vacation Bible School. Every year we attract not less than 250,000 children in different language group. God willing in 2013, 2013, our aim is to reach 300,000 children. Now, these literature are printing in large number in, in, in Kerala. And we transport into different states and we translate these materials into local languages and in turn we are training the people to take the task and going into different programs and we train our teens every year in our teens camp we attract almost 500 students we teach them the doctrine and this is the platform where we can challenge them for the ministry and every year many people many young boys and girls are taking decision for the full time oh you know, many a time we heard that it's difficult for the foreigners to come to India and all, you know. Look at these girls, Amanda and uh, uh, Lydia. And three Indian girls are sitting with Sari here. <laughs> you know, they all been to India in different places and they were a great motivation for the Indian people. And they were doing a great job challenging even our Indian girls and boys. So I encourage them to come, it, come to India again. And we have special camp for the overseas students. And we have all this literature printed. And you can see some of the literature at the back. And uh, we produce every year a missionary story and a Bible lesson. Through the missionary story, we challenge our younger generation for the missions. And many are committed now for full-time ministry. Along with their job, they are committed. And uh, what a great joy. And these are the materials we transport to North India and distribute. And these are the, some of the VBSs. And we have a school ministry. Some of our boys with the puppets, they go to school. You look at 1,500 to 1,800 students are attending three to four hours for this kind of program. Some of the areas you can see, we, in us follow up, we have the children's club. And also, for North India, after the VBS, there was nothing for us to teach. So then we met MS. We have a large number of materials available. This is uh, Jim Fleming. Last week he was with us in Kerala. And now MS and uh, SBS, we are working together to produce a lot of literature for the children. And we give them training for using that. Also, we have the VBS teachers training across, the, in, across India. By this time, we were able to train almost 5,000 to 6,000 people, men and women in our assemblies. We have 2,500, 2,500 assemblies. And if we take five people from each assembly, we can do much more, and that is our target now. This is uh, Miss Phyllis Treasure, PN Treasure from New Zealand, at the age of 20. At the age of 20, she came to India, living there still. And she's, she served the Lord for 55 years there. There's a Bible school, and this is the girl's orphanage, and she still, still lives there, and some of you can come and visit there. This is the Brethren Bible Institute. This is the... Uh, Thiruvalla Medical Mission Hospital started by Gilmore Davis and Churchward and other missionaries. And still the teamwork is going on. And 
you know when we are in the ministry we need some mentors motivators this great man of god okay paul thomas he's with the lord when i came from bahrain to india for the ministry he's the one took me to north indian states and introduced me and given me the pulse of india we have such great people when i am speaking here i know some of my colleagues my people are praying fasting and praying today amen and uh, johnson c philip dr johnson c philip he is doing a, an extensive work he is the one who helped me to compile all these materials we need mentors brothers and sisters maybe you cannot go to india you cannot go into the ministry but you can pray for, pray for the people to make a call to india one age they are giving free no need to send money no need to go there call them or send an email brother we are praying for you that's enough that's that's the way we can enter into the ministry so assembly work in northeastern states you can see this uh, young couple few years ago they came to india from denver johnson and happy they were there for 6 months and saw the lord in different areas medical camps now we are concentrated on one particular group of people known as uh, riang they are in the misoram tribura border there are 100000 people you see the refugee camp and the children's situation we have an assembly hall we have six assemblies there and 120 to 150 people are gathering in in we translated our materials this is a school they don't have any curriculum we translated our sunday school book into riang uh, language and they are using it for the glory of god each time when i go to north india i take some of pe- some of my colleagues with me some of them are business people some of them are professionals when we take them and expose them to the ministry they are moved with compassion like the jesus like jesus and they are willing to offer training school, schools and offer uh, some support to them one brother donated this almost he spent uh, uh, 70000 dollars just to make an assembly hall and a construction for the people there talking about sps this is my project okay <laughs> well i was born and brought up in sps sps is a great ministry in india i told you we have 480 million children what are we going to do with the 8 480 million children in india 480 million children i said we meet 300000 children every year comparing to 480 and 300 where is the comparison where is the ratio we have to train maximum people that's why this camp center we are going to use and during the last december we dedicated it for the glory of god and we have conducted the master teachers training all india master teachers training we have trained the 50 people two from bangladesh and in turn this men and women they go to their respective states and train the local people in their language if i go to a north indian state i am just like you i am a foreigner there but if you train these people language is okay for them climate is okay for them food social setup everything is okay for them so our aim is to train maximum people at least 20000 people by 2025 is it possible is it possible yes it is possible so we have to pray and uh, this was the master teachers training and the dedication look at this man ah joraju he always calls me and you know move on move on what are you doing now move to north india train people you know and he often come to india and encourage the american uh, believers to come to india and help in the ministry and india is actually 600 different nations with one country that's what we mentioned you know we have 28 states plus seven union territories and under one roof these 600 nations are living can you imagine it even america speaking the same language eating the same mcdonalds they cannot live together <laughs> but look at these people they live in harmony and they are working for the lord so lot of things to do and bible we have translated into 70 languages william carey i think my friend will talk about that you can see different languages it is written there so in my souvenir kept on the back you can see different languages written on our currency you can have a copy as a souvenir i brought it so visit on the back and see the different languages 
So these are the challenges. I think Brother Shali will talk further on the Bible translation. Present difficulties. More than six states, they pass the anti-conversion bill in the assemblies. So it is difficult for one person to change his religion. India is a religious freedom country, but it is difficult. And the evangelists, they are not able to get accommodation. They are not able to get a place for worship. Even in Kochi, we find it difficult. Now, in, to get an assembly hall in Kochi, at least we need $250,000. And the, I told you, 1.5 million people are living there. So we have to make a training center to reach the people, and that's, we are in our plan. So what, what is our role in the ministry? Do we have a burden for India? Are you interested in making a difference in India? What can you do with your resources? Will you share the vision with others and come to India? Now, North India is in, in, in South India. You know, many people are coming for employment in Kerala now. Now, this week in my city, there is a meeting for Bengali, Hindi and Odia speaking people. Convention. Because they don't have any objection because they are free from their parents and system. So they are in Kerala now. So we have a lot of opportunities like Shalu who can speak Hindi. They are coming and helping the ministry there. So the Lord said, and the great commission is not for the evangelists, my friends. It is for everybody. Go make disciples. Go preach the gospel and make disciples. That is the need of the hour. The harvest is truly plentiful. Bob Dad mentioned that. You know, while I was presenting a similar program in Bahrain in 1995, I was working with my wife there. She was working in the hospital and I was in the printing industry. In one fine evening around midnight, I was presenting on India. And then I challenged the people there who will go to India. The harvest is truly plentiful and the laborers are few. To my surprise, one of my colleagues stood up and said, I'm willing to go. I was a bit confused, Lord, who will support him? The brethren believers are the only people in the world who live by faith. And it is a surprise. He is serving the Lord in India. Afterwards, the second altar called, who else will go to India? The harvest is truly plentiful and the laborers are few. At that moment, in the cool of the night, the Lord spoke to me. Abraham, you are asking others to go to India. Why can't you go to India? I raised my hand. Amen. I resigned my job with my wife. We are in India. My nephew, Justin Kurula, is sitting here. His father came to USA 40 years ago. Several times he wanted to file me to come to come and live in the US. Then who will do the evangelism in India? I urge all the believers here. Like John F. Kennedy once mentioned, ask not what the country can do for you. Ask what you can do for the country. In 1960, that was the famous quote he mentioned. Ask not what CMML, ask not what the evangelist, ask not what the missionaries can do. What is your role? Pray to the Lord of the harvest. He said, pray, pray, pray. He did not ask everybody to go to India or to mission field. Just pray. When you pray, sometimes the Lord will speak to you like me. How many of you are praying for your children as a missionary? I know, I heard that a lot of children are here today. Praise the Lord. Young couples, thank you. That is the best investment you can do in your life for your kids. And when you do that, your children will take the challenge and go for the mission. Let me conclude here. What is your role? If you pray or not, if you pray or not, India will be evangelized. If you pray, you will be a part of it. Let me add some more. If you pay or not, if you visit or not, if you give or not, India will be evangelized. Do you want a part in the ministry in India? Come. Let us work together.
may his name be glorified thank you